So unless there's any questions. So here's the picture of Columbus we were just looking at. And I think Maggie pointed out that, yes, this is in fact Christopher Columbus. And here you've got this kind of strange portrayal of Christopher Columbus. It's not really what we've seen or what you might expect. I think famously Columbus is often depicted arriving ashore. And this is very different than that in case you notice the title. This is the deportation of Columbus. So any first thoughts about this? What, what do you think I, is this triumphant? Is it, would you characterize this portrayal of Columbus as triumphant? Yes, Maggie. Not necessarily. What about it feels maybe less, because the colors sure might feel, and it certainly seems like it could be, you know, maybe at first glance triumphant, but then maybe upon further inspection, you notice some elements that aren't as triumphant or glorious. What do you think, what for you maybe seems less triumphant? Um, I suppose it's just the fact that no one's really doing much of anything. Yeah, there's not the sort of the fanfare of arriving. People are just sort of standing around. It feels very candid, informal. Um, Julian, what were you going to add? To me, personally, I mean, he looks like kind of frail, almost, like sheepishly getting into the boat or being helped into the boat. And you can even see over off to the right, there are some people that look to be talking to each other. And they kind of, at least to me, look like they might be like joking around or something like that. Yeah, I think that observation about him sort of being helped onto the boat really kind of makes it feel sort of like he's in this sort of state of disgrace. I mean, yeah, people standing around rather than sort of triumphantly arriving. So if, and if he's clearly, he seems to be departing from the new world. So, um, and any other, any other comments about what we see here, um, apart from what we've already said? And it seems like we're in Cuba. So I would point out, this is by a Cuban artist we're gonna look at today. And so here we have a Cuban artist tackling the subject matter, which is Columbus, being deported from Cuba. Anything that makes you think about, and you know, if you thought you might want to consider that we're going to enter this, this age of looking at the end of Spanish occupation of Cuba. So you might think, well, this is a Cuban artist at the end of the 1800s tackling a subject which is kind of dated, you know, several hundred years prior, you know, if not, you know, what, 400 years, 300 years prior. And so you sh it should make you think, well, gee, why is this Cuban artist tackling the subject? And I would point out again that the subject isn't what you typically expect, the glorious arrival of the Spanish, but rather this sort of disgraceful, sheepish departure, as Julian said, of Columbus from Cuba. So I think already you could see how this fits into what's going on in Cuba. Now we have a Cuban artist reinventing Columbus, or at least revisiting him and framing him as a sort of disgraced colonizer. And I think you can all already understand how that might fit into the history going on in Cuba with uh, the Spanish-American War, or at least the Cuban independence, war for independence. So we'll go back to this in a moment, because I think it's a interesting question what the artist's true message here, because you could say this is a painting about the departure of the Spanish from Cuba. You could say maybe it's more of a picture about sort of the disillusionment of, of Columbus and the sort of reality of, of of discovery being a sort of sheepish departure um, or something else. And I think that something else might also be interesting when we look at the reasons why Columbus was deported from Cuba. So we'll get back to this in a moment, but I think as far as setting up the United States and sort of the Spanish-American War, it's important to look at this as a, Cu a work by a Cuban artist tackling the Spanish-American War or the War for Independence from the point of view of uh, a a historical precedent like Columbus's departure from Cuba. And also you notice the style of painting is very much what you might call social realism or kind of realism, um, even treating history with that brushstroke of realism. Now you could make an argument that there's some idealization, but I think underlying all this is much more of a that photographic, almost photorealism. And this is a very important thing to point out apart from the initial things I said, because one of the major 
challenges for the revolutions of the 20th century. And I mean, the Mexican revolution, the Soviet revolution in 1914. Um, and then of course you have the Cuban revolution and many other revolutions. And of course you could say the Nazis represent another example of a new change of government and having to address the issue of what kind of art visualizes the revolution or visualizes a new government. So you might consider what kind of art forms are available for artists to use to either celebrate the revolution or to just sort of express revolutionary values. So social realism is one possibility. Another possibility we'll see more of today is modernism. Modernism is very much the sort of fruit of the late 19th century and the influence of photography and art. You can see an example here of an artist we'll see more of next week called Rick, with Fredo Lamb. And we'll be looking at his work and his biography um, in depth. And he, he's a, probably the most famous Cuban artist um, there is. And I think you can see what a contrast between social realism on the left and modernism on the right. I'm only showing you these side by side, not because the subject matter is the same, though they are both addressing Cuban subjects. The one on the right really, I think, is a, is encapsulates the sort of modern um, visual vocabulary of abstraction. And we'll get back into that in a moment. But these two different kinds of art forms are sort of these two approaches to art in Cuba, one at the late 1800s um, and the other are in the early 1900s. And they're both possibilities for, you know, what the Cuban revolution could embrace either of these as a vehicle, visual vehicle for the arts. But what we'll discover, what we'll find is that neither of these catch on as a sort of vehicle for revolution. You might expect the one on the left to be what most governments would embrace as a vehicle for revolution. And I mean, to a degree, the Mexican revolution embraces muralism, which has an element of realism, but you could make an argument that's a little less realistic than what, than what we see here. And we'll see in the Soviet revolution, they very much embrace the social realism, at least for a while. And for example, Hitler in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, he completely rejects modernism. I don't know if you know this, Hitler was an art school dropout and he hated modernism and he embraced social realism like you see on the left to the point, not just to the point where not only did he, did the Nazis celebrate social realism, but they also denigrated modernism and literally put on a show of modernist art and invited Germans to go see it as a way to lampoon and make fun of, make a mockery of modernism. So I point this out because in the 20th century, modernism becomes a major form of art, but it's not as revolutionary as the revolutions, revolutionary governments of the 20th century um, want it to be, or at least they don't embrace modernism as the main sort of vocabulary of revolution. And that's something I want you guys to think about today as we look at modernism. What about it um, is either, what, what about modernism makes it more or less revolutionary? And of course that depends on how you define revolution. Um, and that'll be an ongoing question you, we, we look at as we move forward. Um, both looking at modernism and also considering some of the other models for revolution like Mexico, which we'll see today. And later in another day, we'll look at Soviet revolution and how it um, addresses social realism or modernism, um, the vanguard and Soviet Union. So that's what we'll be looking at moving forward. So for example, here in Mexico or in Mexico, you see after the Mexican revolution, this effort to crystallize national identity using muralism. And I think a lot of us would expect, oh, of course, the Cuban government after the revolution in 1959 embraces muralism. It's a no brainer that muralism sort of would serve the Cuban revolution. But sadly, or not sadly, if you don't kill it, maybe you don't like muralism, but for me, sadly, the Cuban government doesn't embrace muralism, at least not in the same way that um, you see the Mexican government embrace muralism. So that's an interesting reality of the Cuban revolution. Um, as we move forward, it doesn't adopt Mexican muralism, which is not to say that it doesn't, it isn't influenced by Mexican muralism, but we'll see that um, when we get to Cuban art, it's really unlike anything um, in America or in Mexico in the United States or in the rest of the world. Um, it has elements of, of Soviet 
a style, elements of North of the United States, elements of maybe Mexico, but um, it's definitely its own animal, its own, its own thing. So these are some of the broad themes we're going to be looking at: muralism versus easel painting, one; um, social realism versus modernism, and also we'll be looking at the influence of the United States um, on Cuba. So let's go back to that picture you looked at. So a lot of you had sent in really great responses about this. And I think everyone understands that we're looking at the United States kind of pretending, masquerading as Colombia or the spirit of, of the Americas. Um, some people said the Statue of Liberty and she's kind of the same this sort of personification of liberty, but obviously she's not just liberty. She's also meant to be the United States. What's one visual argument here for why she's meant to be the United States. What visually here suggests that she's not just Colombia, but she's also the United States personified? Yes, Hayden. Uh, I definitely say, like, based on the like what she's wearing, it's very much like American flag esque, like colors and patterns. Right, right. We've got the sort of bare, the the American flag sort of reduced to sort of a dress or transformed into a dress and kind of a cape, the stars and stripes, right? So I think we can all agree that even though you could make a very sort of rose colored interpretation of this and, and really kind of elevate the United States onto some pedestal and say, this is just sort of a picture of freedom and, and this sort of personification of freedom kind of mentoring this young Cuban Republic. But I think to be much more fair and honest, I think we could all agree that this is a very sort of patronizing view of Cuba and that she's really meant to be the United States and how is Cuba, a lot of you mentioned Cuba's portrayed as an infant sort of needing protection, walking away, unable to sort of maybe be on its own. Would you say this, is this a flattering portrayal of Cuba or a derogatory portrayal of Cuba? Definitely demeaning, right. What is, what's the meaning about it, Aishu? You can chat if you don't want to um, speak. Well, specifically, I think the fact that Cuba is being represented in the form of an infant, kind of like, and having um, the US of sorts like watching over almost like as a parental figure is kind of like insinuating in a sense that, um, oh, guidance is needed or something like that. So it's very like patronizing in a sense. Yeah, the United States was once, you know, a new colony, right, after the revolution against England. So, you know, imagine the United States had another country sort of watching over its right, independence. Right. right, so it's sort of this, it's kind of like uh, American imperialism masquerading as virtue. I think that's kind of what's going yeah, on here. Sure. So you've got this woman clearly representing the United States and Cuba treated as sort of the infant um, yes, needs guidance, isn't able to govern itself right. So just imagine you go off to college and then your parents follow you or something like that, right? They, they wait outside your door to help, you know, it's just not giving you the independence you really have. And by the way, when you, if you learn about Cuban independence, the Cubans were very much about to win independence from Spain when the United States swooped in and sort of stole the uh, independence from Cuba. So yeah, it, it disregards all the history of Cuba, you know, treating Cuba like an infant treats Cuba like it hasn't been a country for longer, or at least a, a place with sort of Spanish, a Spanish colony for longer than the United States. You know, Cuba was the first country where Columbus arrived. So, you know, it's, it's very patronizing to, for the United States to treat Cuba like it's younger <laughs> when the United States is much younger. Um, and yes, it's seeking to justify U.S. involvement. I absolutely agree. So it's a very propagandistic picture masquerading as virtue. Um, and we'll see that the United States, as it becomes an empire, well, before this, this kind of satirical or sort of maybe cartoonish picture, we see Uncle Sam. So in a way, I think when the United States becomes an empire, the use of this sort of female benefactor figure tries to visually soften the sort of teeth of us being an empire. And one of the key elements of becoming an empire, in addition to winning the Spanish-American War, is the Panama Canal, as we'll see. Um, and of course, the Monroe Doctrine is the sort of the 
the paradigm of foreign policy by the United States that says no foreign powers, no European powers, and that will become no, including uh, the Soviet Union um, or excluding the Soviet Union too, um, are, we basically say they may not interfere in the Western hemisphere. So that's United, this is United States sort of um, exclusive domain and dominion. And yes, she was, looks very patronizing toward Cuba. You know, she's kind of, you know, obviously looking down, but very much like the mother and an infant. And Cuba looks very much like it has no idea, no autonomy whatsoever. And the outfit's ridiculous. You know, it's sort of a kid, no Cuban is dressed like this. She's got sort of a bullfighting jacket with a dress, a skirt, and a, a hat, and those earrings. It's a ridiculous outfit that, that young little Cuba is wearing there. Um, so we'll revisit this when we look at some other examples of America, uh, sort of satirical cartoons. But I think you guys understand that this is definitely sort of propaganda meant to prop up the United States and sort of tacitly or, or overtly um, justify America's involvement in Cuba. Now, another thing you've noticed in your syllabus, I've asked you to think about what kinds of elements of Cuban history does the Cuban government celebrate and retain as sort of part of the revolution? Well, one half of that question is, well, what are the struggles inside of Cuba that the Cuban government has to address? And the other side of that is, what elements of Cuban history does Cuba sort of, does the Cuban revolution sort of incorporate as part of its sort of revolution? And so we'll th see things like Yankee imperialism, the imperial UN, American imperialism is definitely one of the key things that the Cuban revolution is addressing, the sort of continued dependency on the United States in the 20th century and other internal problems like the, the aftermath of slavery, uh, the need for land reform, the great disparities between the richer middle class and upper classes in the cities and the landowners versus the rural poor, the um, impoverished rural parts of Cuba, to name a few. And of course, the ongoing importance of sugar as a means of um, production, as a means of making money, and that the need for cheap labor to keep harvesting sugar. These are all the kinds of problems the Cuban government will have to confront. So we'll get back to this painting in a moment. I want to point out those concerns here. As we look at modernism, you'll see some of the seeds of revolution, tackling things like, like I just said, sort of a rural poverty, the lack of public education, um, modernization, um, and all kinds of other problems we'll see as the revolution approaches. So neither of these forms of art become really what you would call typical contemporary Cuban art. There are exceptions, but what I think is interesting about this period before the revolution is we see Cuba embrace modernism and have some degree of uh, kind of history with social realism, but <laughs> neither of these art forms, neither of these art forms become sort of the sort of epitome of Cuban revolutionary art. And why that is will be something we see as we move forward. Uh, any questions so far about anything? All right, if you have questions, you can text me or chat me. So this picture we looked at briefly at the end of last class, and I think it just goes to show that Cuba, in Cuba life goes on as, as it was, even with the American occupation, you could say like we've replaced the United States, but not much changes in Cuba. And I think, again, that's, that's true to a degree. Um, the United States does have an impact on Cuba, but I think a lot of people would argue it's a negative impact. So we substitute one colonizer, Spain, for another, the United States. And again, it's the Monroe Doctrine that really is America's justification for taking control of Cuban independence, probably so that no other European powers will interfere in Cuba's destiny. So let's take a look at how that plays out in the arts, shall we? So here is one of the art schools, one of the more important established art schools in Cuba that was founded in the early 1800s. And so by now in the late 1800s, we see, and I don't know why it has that safety pin. I assume that's some contemporary art from the more recent years. I don't think that's like a Photoshop thing. Um, but we see the fruit or the beneficiaries of, of the art school in the form of some of these artists in the late 20th century, uh, late 19th century. So you might consider how some of this painting relate to either the personal or historical. And I'm just setting up these, this two, the spectrum so you can understand this question of 
what what art form does a revolution embrace? Because I think what you find is someone like Frida Kahlo, um, her work is very personal. Or so work like this is very much you know a one on one experience between the viewer and the subject. In this case, it looks like um, Leopoldo Romagnac was definitely kind of taking an interest in Cuban subjects. I think there's a little bit of pageantry to these pictures um, that for me feels kind of similar to some of the custom Brista stuff we saw. Um, only now we've taken these subjects and put them indoors. But when I see his, these paintings, I notice how most of the subjects are inside um, with this bright Cuban sunshine, but mostly indoors um, and with sort of elements that feel very prop-like. But I think apart from that, maybe minor criticism, they feel very much like personal paintings, one-on-one, -on -one, really meant to be sort of, you know, obviously easel paintings. But these would be, you know, what I think most people typically think of, you know, painting a subject, a portrait, and there's a very one-on-one -on -one quality to a portrait. Um, that's, of course, there's exceptions to that. But I think as far as helping you understand the sort of on one end of the spectrum with art, you've got this one-on-one -on -one personal engagement with the subject versus what we'll see with murals, which are much more public or even poster art, much more public and not meant to be so one-on-one -on -one as more of a public sort of engagement with art. So this I would put as, or peg as one extreme of art with this sort of personal, highly personal one-on-one -on -one engagement. Um, and with someone like Armando Menocal, as we'll see, his work is much more kind of addressing maybe more historical subjects. So these feel a little bit, they are still easel paintings, but he's kind of tackling subjects at much more sort of a, a, a wider lens, maybe not one-on-one -on -one so much as looking at these maybe class or looking at social settings. And I mean, it looks like we're looking at a scene from the movie Titanic here. And some of his earlier paintings tackle these heavy subject matters. If I recall, this is a moment from the, the Reconquista in Spain. I think this Alfonso, one of the kings of Spain, doing some kind of public display of, of um, solidarity. And you don't need to get into the historical details so much as to recognize just that he's tackling big historical subjects, but making them relevant to the contemporary Cuban situation. And you see that especially with his painting um, about Columbus, we'll go back to in a moment. I would just point out this idea of kind of resurrecting historical subject matter and making it relevant to the contemporary world is something you saw in the French Revolution with the death of Socrates, for example, being all about sacrifice and sacrificing on behalf of your nation. Well, here in the late 1800s, you see Cuban artists addressing Spanish colonization, but through historical subject matter, which I think is a clever way of sort of maybe tackling controversy from the point of view of maybe historical precursors, sim similar kind of historical events and sort of encoding any of the controversy into these historical visualizations. And that I think you see here with Columbus sort of sheepishly departing from the new world. So now I'll show you, this is what I found in the, my research on this painting. Because at first when I saw this, I'm like, oh, another picture of Columbus, kind of maybe he's maybe it's a little more realistic, like it's not so formal, he's not posing. But upon further research, I noticed what I saw here in the bottom in yellow, um, <coughs> which is this guy, Boabila, Bobadilla, he um, captured Columbus because he, they the Spanish government was, was mad that Columbus hanged five Spaniards who were committing atrocities against the natives. And of course, when I read this, probably like you, I'm like, oh, wait a second. Now, now I feel very conflicted because I don't know if the artist had this in mind when he painted this painting, or if it's more of a picture about sort of the reality of Columbus's inglorious contributions to Cuba, which is to say on one hand, this artist Menocal, remember this is Menocal, painted this picture to sort of show that Spanish, Spain's occupation of Cuba all those hundreds of years is just sort of doomed to end, which is kind of what you see here with Columbus, sort of the end of Columbus departing Cuba, sort of a, as an analogy to Spain departing Cuba. Or if maybe this is a painting kind of saying, well, Columbus was bad, but you know, here you sort of, if you look at Columbus in light of this, these, these revelations, 
you kind of feel maybe a little more sympathy for Columbus. You feel like, well, maybe it's the Spanish who are kind of removing Columbus and Columbus is sympathetic. I don't know. I would have to research to find out um, where Manukau's sympathies lie. But I think certainly if you if you read about Bobadilla capturing Columbus because Columbus was hanging Spaniards for the atrocities towards the natives, that does seem to kind of, um, at least in this specific trial, this specific case, because I'm sure there are other cases where, uh, and you know, as a fact, for sure, the Spanish were cruel against the natives, but it does seem to kind of throw this painting into further complexity. Um, what do you think? Is this a picture that, is the artist sympathetic towards Columbus here, or is this a disgraceful picture of Columbus now that you know these? Julian, do you think, does this revelation complicate it for you at all, like, the way it does for me? I mean, yeah, because with that added context, and especially with how vibrant the colors are, like you mentioned, you could see it either way. I'm still leaning towards the, this is more of a quiet kind of going gently. Yeah, the first gently. version. This is just like Spain, goodbye. Yeah. I think the artist saying goodbye, Spain, like like Columbus uh, had to leave. Now it's your turn to leave kind of thing. Like get it's, 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 like, it's like not a graceful like gracious goodbye yeah. or anything like that yeah um you know i always wonder how you know i don't know if the artist hired people to dress up in costumes and then they had them pose but and i've met some people who could paint this kind of vivid color from life or from their head but i do wonder i mean if i had i couldn't paint like this but if i wanted to even tackle this i would probably have people dress up in costumes so it's something i wonder about um as far as the execution but let's agree for now that this painting is the artist tackling this historical subject almost as an analogy for just this sort of inevitable departure of Spain from Cuba. So this is like foreshadowing Cuban independence. So this, let's agree there, but I think it, it's worth considering that maybe the artist was considering that Columbus, maybe, maybe they were, you know, revisiting the story of Columbus and some people were um, maybe treating him more sympathetically, but I think we're probably safe seeing him um, not sympathetically here. So let's keep going and see some more art. So remember, we're going to talk about the United States. And here is the Spanish Empire in the late 19th century. Um, or at least, I'm sorry, this is the American Empire. So here we've got what the United States takes control of from Spain. So Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, the Philippines. And of course, we start building the Panama Canal in the late 1900s. And you could see, we'll see what a big sort of you know, what, how important the Panama Canal is, or you can imagine how important it is. Um, so some of these things that are important for you guys to retain as far as what we look at the Cuban revolution are things like um, Yankee imperialism. This is a really big rallying cry for the Cuban revolution. You know, there's no Spanish imperialism at that point. It's really Yankee imperialism. And Yankee is sort of like a, I think a way of referring to, I think, you know, it's an interesting question. I, Yankees refers to the North in the Civil War. You know, the the, the Yankees um, were the North. Of course, there's also the baseball team. Um, and I think Cuba probably started using that word as like a way to sort of mirror the sort of the way the South looked negatively at the North by referring to them, them as Yankees. Like in Mexico, you usually refer to North Americans as gringos. I think Yankee is a little more derogatory I mean, it's not sort of so inflammatory, but I think if you go in Cuba, if you go to Cuba today, you'll see a lot of posters still criticizing Uncle Sam and Yankee imperialism. And all that begins in this era of the United States really kind of jumping in on the, the Cuban war for independence and sort of stealing. Like it's basically like Cuba had been running the marathon to win its war against Spain. And then the United States at the last minute pushes it aside and then crosses the finish line and pretends to sort of have sort of won the revolution or independence on behalf of Cuba. It's that bad. Um, it's really sort of a, and it's a reflection of this very sort of, I think rep, uh, reprehensible for regrettable era of American policy in Latin America before World War I, which is very imperialistic. Now, a lot of the world is reeling from imperialism, especially Africa. This is the age in the 1800s of European colonization of Africa. And so in some ways, the United States is sort of beginning its sort of imperial, um, its imperial sort of, uh, I guess, um, its first steps into imperialism in this era too. 
And you'll see that too with Mexico also sort of adopting a more imperialist stance. And when I say imperial, that means of course, political expansion, maybe even domination of other countries and colonies. But you could also see it as sort of industrialization and modernization at the expense of everything else. And that might, might include the poor, you know, a, a, an equivalent analogy would be maybe neoliberalism today. Neoliberalism means when the IMF or the World Bank goes into a government and tells them you have to cut social spending, you have to um, cut government spending, uh, education and increase privatization and military spending. So it's sort of a, a way of kind of colonizing by controlling where the purse strings of a government. Well, you know, in this era of American imperialism, you have, this is the age of the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, very wealthy uh, capitalists who are so wealthy, they, their wealth exceeds that of nations. So people like Theodore Roosevelt and, you know, presidents sort of are, their, their power is superseded by these, these bankers like Morgan and Rockefellers, oil tycoons. So we definitely are sort of in an era today that's very reminiscent of the late 1900s, because we say people like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, these corporations that are so powerful, you can understand that they have really a lot of, of influence on American foreign policy. And that's true in Cuba and Mexico. And we're gonna look a little bit more about Mexican history, just so you can see the parallels, the obvious parallels between U US imperialism in Mexico and in Cuba, um, because I think you'll find in this era, there's a lot more parallels with the notable exception that Cuba is an island near, uh, near the United States, separated by the, the Straits of Florida versus Mexico being um, a, a border, sharing a border with the United States. So on the subject of American imperialism, this landscape painting, I think is a fascinating example of a painting that I think shows the way Americans saw Cuba. And I think a lot of the world sees Cuba as sort of this exotic playground with people projecting their own ideas of paradise and, and uh, utopia and tropical happiness, but without real sense of the realities of Cuba. Um, so for instance, this picture here was commissioned, this is not a Cuban artist, but this artist was commissioned to make some landscape paintings of Cuba for a bar in New York City intended to transport Cuban people to Cuba. So you've got this sort of semi-neoclassical, um, I guess you would call it a, a, what do you call it, entrance to a building, I'm forgetting the word, a salon maybe. And you know, neoclassical, when you look at um, colonial architecture, it certainly has some elements of the classical era. So, you know, it's not too far off to have, you know, Roman Greek columns, Doric columns, um, but you can see the ferns and some of these trees that's sort of pretending to be tropical. And so they're trying to sort of recreate Cuba in this salon, in this, um, in this um, for, for the life of me, I can't remember the entry, entry area of a building, but I think you can appreciate what I'm getting at here is sort of transforming the first floor of this building in New York into a kind of Cuba-like environment where they sold cigars, probably drank rum. Here's a slightly warped picture, but I just love how they're trying to make it all tropical um, in New York City. And here you can see, it is in New York City. I might, I might be wrong about the city. I'm pretty sure it's New York. Um, and here you can see, this is the bar, the cigars, and there above are the, is this painting there. So, you know, the idea of commissioning an artist to paint a landscape of Cuba that goes in a bar above the cigars, really, I think, goes to show the sort of real extent of America's interest in Cuba um, it's really very superficial. Okay, we want the cigars, we want the rum, we want to see the landscape, we like the, the plants, but there's no interest in the people or in sort of the, the, the supporting the revolution or anything revolutionary. This is very much what I think you'd expect today with people interested in Cuba in a very sort of superficial way. Um, but these aren't you know revolutionary paintings at all. This is very much sort of one side of US imperialism um, and here you can see uh, the way Cuban, Cuba was portrayed before the Spanish-American War. And here we have Uncle Sam. So it's interesting to me that in Uncle Sam becomes, you know, Colombia becomes a more maternal figure. I think that might be a way of softening America's uh, appearance by other countries to make it seem less maybe aggressive. But what would you say about this is before, so that picture we saw that you guys looked at, this is before that picture. 
So what would you say is going on here? What are we looking at here? What, how is Cuba portrayed here? Yes, Maggie. Yes, she is. Uh, uh, Cuba is, uh, is being portrayed as being like this helpless nation. Yeah, that flag is very much kind of like the shelter. You know, the funny, the, the idea of a flag as like a protection. Yeah, the crouching woman cowering under U.S. protection. Yes, it, for me, this very much reminds me of a painting from The Last Judgment or The Last Judgment by Michelangelo at the, in the uh, Sistine Chapel, where that's Jesus and the Virgin Mary next to her, sort of this sheltered by Jesus. So it's kind of using some of this kind of Renaissance um, Catholic imagery to show Cuba in need of protection. And those would be Spanish forces there on the on the left there, the Spanish colonizers, uh, the military. Yes, Julia, was that Julian who had their hand up? Yeah, I also think it's kind of interesting and I think I understand why uh, it's the, the imagery changes over time, uh, comparing this one to the one that uh, we talked about um, over like uh, the discussions, but um, like the, yeah, that one, but it's, Interesting, because this one, it seems a lot more gentle and maternal, but with this one, especially with the added, like, people coming out of the jungle, it looks less like the U.S. is protecting Cuba, like in this one, and more like, oh, it just got there first. Right. This, and it this, seems very aggressive. This one is more like we just got there first, or this one here? This one here. The, the one, yeah, the yeah. one that you, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. It's that the idea that we're ours first, kind of we're... We're kind of claiming it. The flag kind of feels like we're claiming it. And I agree, there's a very different in tone between this. I mean, this one feels just, you know, feels really, you know, at first, really like kind of, you know, it's, it's using the same kind of kind of appeal, you know, mother and a young child versus sort of here we've got kind of angry military, kind of um, much more standoffish. So, you know, it's interesting to note this shift and you're also going to see as we move forward, the United States foreign policy does dramatically change. Not necessarily this dramatic, uh, not necessarily the same drama you see between this and this one, but also just an overall shift from the imperial policy, kind of marking American policy in the late 1800s until about 1910-ish, and then a big change to what's called the good neighbor policy. And I laugh a little bit because what is it's hard to separate a lot of these changes in the arts and culture from the the sort of puppeteers in the background the capitalists the the cold warriors the sort of banks who are controlling a lot of these changes you're going to see um so for instance you know what the united states the united states changes its foreign policy partly because of the mexican revolution and the united states realizes okay we can't have a revolution on our front door, you know, literally a Mexican revolution scares the United States. And we go from this sort of imperialist attitude toward to one of called the good neighbor policy, where basically we have to fight World War One, World War Two. There's Mexican revolution next door and eventually the Cuban revolution next door. And you've got the Soviet revolution with the threat of communism spreading around the world. And at somewhere around then, the United States realizes, OK, we need to change our foreign policy toward Latin America or else we're going to be seen as just like, you know, real un unlikable people. Right. Unlikable country. And I point this out because it's really important to understand that United States foreign policy really shifts based on self-interest, not on any other kind of sort of moral compass. And I think you got to keep that in mind as we move forward, that the 20th century is going to present a whole host of, another, of new problems for the United States, and it's going to trigger a reevaluation of our relationship to Cuba and Mexico, especially as you know, um, the Cuban Revolution will be very much a response to Yankee imperialism. So we're going to see how the Mexican Revolution is also the beginning of the shift in foreign policy. Let me see how we're doing on time. I think we got a few more minutes and we can keep watching a little more of this sort of American imperialistic age. Here's another political cartoon from the time. Um, tell me about this one. 
it looks like to be the same era as the one we just saw, right? The Uncle Sam as a sort of Civil War uh, soldier. He looks like a Union soldier with striped pants. You know, he's meant to be the America because the American flag. But you can see the sort of caricatures of all the nations around him. In the back, it says Nicaragua. I can't see what it says in the bottom, that Venezuela. Um, maybe that's Brazil in the back. Obviously, the artist is caricaturing England and other Portugal. And the United States is dressed, I think, in the most sort of plain way. But it's really, I think, a picture about the Monroe Doctrine. Um, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, again, is European powers stay out of the Western Hemisphere. And that's, I think, what you see here. And here is the Spanish Empire before, um, at the earlier part of the century, remember with Cuba still part of Spain, you know, Dominican Republic, Haiti had declared independence. So this is what Spain had, and this is what Spain is be by the end of the century. And the United States defeats Spain, and the United States takes control basically over the Spanish Empire. And we build the Spanish and we build the Panama Canal. So here is the pretext for the Spanish American War was the sinking of a battleship called the Maine. And this is kind of like the way 9 11 was the pretext for invading Iraq or Afghanistan. Some people think it was uh, an intentional sort of explosion. I think more likely it was an accident, or maybe we just took advantage of this thing that happened. Or maybe it could have been sort of a conspiracy to trigger this war with Spain. I think anyone would agree that the war with Spain was sort of an inevitability given the US foreign policy of the Monroe Doctrine. So you have the likes of the Rough Riders, Teddy Roosevelt, this is Tampa, here in Tampa, they depart from Tampa to go to Cuba and they basically seize control of the Cuban War for Independence, which was on the verge of being won. The Cubans were very close to winning independence from Spain but for the fact that the United States came in and gave it the last little push, but instead of really helping Cuba to attain that level of autonomy, the United States took control over Cuba with things like the Platt Amendment. So the Platt Amendment basically said in the Spanish or in the, in the Cuban constitution that the United States has the right to intervene in Cuba whenever we want. <laughs> so that's really a carte blanche sort of uh, you know, that gives the United States carte blanche foreign policy monopoly over Cuba. And in addition to the Platt Amendment, the United States permanently puts the, our naval base in Guantanamo and basically becomes a, the Cuba becomes a protectorate. So this painting here, going back to the artist we saw a moment ago, Menocal, this is another example of historical realism. <laughs> and another example, I think, that shows the value of historical realism, or at least on that spectrum towards historical realism and how it really kind of helps crystallize that sense of revolution and maybe celebrating elements of history that are sort of revolutionary. So the main subject is, is the death of Maceo, who was one of the fighters on behalf of independence. And we'll get back to this in a moment um, as we look at the sort of aftermath of Spanish, uh, the Spanish-American War. So here are the Rough Riders. Notably, I don't see any Cubans here. I think maybe there's some Cubans fighting in the back. You can see some African-American soldiers. Now the U.S. Army is integrated after, um, you know, after the Civil War. But and that, you know, that's an interesting subject as far as Cuba and the United States having, you know, common uh, history with slavery, um, but for a subject for another day. And you can see the Rough Riders here. I think conspicuously absent would be the Cubans, probably. Maybe there are some exceptions, but I think the point here is to show sort of the United States as sort of the victor. And here's the American flag going up over Havana or going down. Here's the Cuban flag going up. By the way, if you don't know, the Cuban flag has the red star, the red triangle, and the Puerto Rican flag has the blue triangle. That's one way to distinguish between the two. But for all intents and purposes, you might as well just have the U.S. flag going up because um, the Cuban Revolution will really kind of will be the thing that finally raises the Cuban flag over Cuba um, and and lowers the American flag symbolically as far as ending America's imperialism in Cuba. So, you know, you can imagine the kinds of things America is interested in Cuba for sugar, property ownership. You know, Coca-Cola, a lot of the sugar made for Coca-Cola was produced in Cuba. Um, and here's a picture of the military base in, in Guantanamo, courtesy of the U.S. Navy, because, of course, you can't go to Guantanamo and take pictures or you'll probably get arrested. So having a naval base 
in Cuba is a big deal. You know, right now, China, I think, is trying to establish some kind of military presence or um, some kind of political presence in Cuba, probably as a response to our presence in uh, Taiwan or Korea. And so in a way, we're seeing a repeat of maybe a possible you know, Cuban missile crisis um, as we move forward. And remember, this is still a kind of black eye in Cuba's sort of um, Cuba's self image, because even though the Cuban revolution happens, the United States still has a naval base in Cuba on the far side in, in Guantanamo. And here you could see the four important eras of foreign policy, the imperial era, which I'd say goes up until about 1910, and then the good neighbor policy, which is the era we're going to go into. And this really, again, is triggered by the, the Mexican Revolution. So we're going to focus on that um, as we move into the second part of class. And I think we'll see a little bit of it before the break. So here's Teddy Roosevelt. And he adds a little bit to the Monroe Doctrine called the Roosevelt Corollary. And it's basically a continuation of the same idea. The United States has the right to intervene. I think we become the official debt collector. This is the a this is the era when the United States literally sends troops into Haiti and takes control over the treasury and literally steals like millions of dollars of gold, if not billions, from the treasury of Haiti under the pretense of you know we have we're better fit to control um, the Haitian. Um, uh, the Haitian treasury. So whether it's in Cuba or in Haiti or other countries in Latin America, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt sends ships to Chile. He, he sends ships to Japan, uh, famously. And so this is really the age of US imperialism. And we haven't quite gotten to the good neighbor policy. And one of the things guiding, driving this, this age of imperialism is this Panama Canal, which really opens up um, the American economy, the sort of idea of American hegemony or control over the world economy, um, because you can see what an important trade route it is um, being able to pass through the Panama Canal. And going back to this painting now, I want you to think about this character, Jose Marti. You guys hopefully should have read a little bit about uh, Jose Marti in the form of his famous poem, Nuestra America. Now, we mentioned that the Cuban government will celebrate some elements, some characters from the Cuban history, the most important of whom is Jose Marti. And Jose Marti is famous throughout Latin America. I think he's famous in North America. He's a wonderfully accessible poet. I highly recommend reading his poetry. It's wonderfully accessible um, and wonderfully sort of political in a very kind of transcendent way. And I think Nuestra America really captures his sort of spirit of fighting for this war of kind of Latin America and the new world itself, kind of taking the torch of freedom, kind of the values of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, and, and kind of reinventing Latin America and the image of, of, of those values. So you could see this picture right here, kind of as a picture of Jose Marti, who likewise was killed during the Spanish-American War. So he's sort of this tragic martyr having fought for many decades to rally people um, to the cause of Cuban independence, he dies in the Cuban uh, in the Spanish American War. And you could say his his values very much kind of um, are still kind of the sort of underlying values of the Cuban Revolution, independence, the end of slavery, um, freedom. And you could see this picture of the death of Maceo is sort of like almost like you're looking at the death of Jose Marti, the same kind of tragedy. Um, and you could also look at this as sort of not just a picture of the death of someone who fought for Cuban independence, but also the death of Cuban independence itself because the United States takes control over Cuban independence with the Platt Amendment and basically makes Cuba dependent on the United States. So everything but the maternal sort of relationship we see in that picture at the beginning Instead, we see a very much like an imperial aggressive country that treats Cuba as a kind of a, a protectorate. So Jose Marti, and we're going to end before the break on Jose Marti because he is a very important figure. He's still celebrated by the Cuban Revolution, celebrated around Latin America. Some people think he, he used a lot of cocaine and that drove a lot of his writing because he has he's a very, um, very prolific writer. And at this time in late 1800, a lot of people use cocaine. And someone was telling me recently that 
uh, Jose Barti probably used a lot of drugs that that was fueling a lot of his writing. And maybe you can feel a little bit of that energy in Western America. But I think what I love about his poetry is it really speaks to the new world, not just to Latin America, though I think it's principally to Latin America. His work kind of tackles the new world as a kind of a new phenomenon in world history, um, especially because he traveled between Havana, New York City, and Spain, sort of like someone like Federico Garcia Lorca, um, we Fredo Lam, you see that triangle between Cuba, maybe the United States and Spain as being sort of a very important kind of cross-pollination between those two places. And of course, these three values of the French Revolution are very much guiding Jose Marti. Remember, fraternity isn't the sort of a frat, it's sort of the idea of care, sharing common interests, profession, uh, feeling of friendship. So these are the values of the French Revolution. This is what Napoleon was supposed to represent. Now remember, Bolivar was someone who, who supported Napoleon and then didn't support Napoleon because Napoleon became an emperor. And then Bolivar himself sort of became a king or an emperor. So he's sort of another example of someone who kind of betrayed the idea of these of, of the revolution, whereas I think someone like Jose Marti very much died sacrificing on behalf of these values. He was a staunch critic of slavery and the, and the sort of uh, stain of slavery in Cuba. Um, and I want to end before the break by looking at some examples of Jose Marti in art, just a few examples so you can see how important he is. And so let's take a look at that. And so here are some pictures showing just a few examples of, of sort of showing you how important he is. And I have this up on online. You're welcome to take a look. I want to start here. So here's a few pictures showing that you're going to see a lot of him in art period in Cuba. But I think around the world, he's very much a voice. Of, I think he'd be similar to, let's see, maybe a, I think a Che Guevara, or maybe a, a Zapata on Pancho Villa, maybe less, to a degree, less militant, more intellectual but the same kind of transcendent sort of figure of revolution in the 20th century. Um, here, let's go to this. This is a Diego Rivera mural. Um, you know, Diego Rivera is a Mexican muralist. We'll see some of his work in the second half of class. And here you can see Jose Marti right next to Frida Kahlo and behind a young Diego Rivera. So he's that, Jose Marti is that important that a Mexican muralist put Jose Marti right next to Frida Kahlo, you know, his wife and another very important Mexican artist. So I think that goes to show how important Jose Marti is. Here he is in many iterations by a Cuban artist. I think a more interesting one here is this example that we'll see later in the semester of a mural made in 1967 when a lot of the world was still very much 100% supportive of the Cuban revolution. And you can see all these artists participate in this wonderful mural kind of celebrating the Cuban revolution, Latin American history. You'll find Jose Marti somewhere in there. Um, and we'll get back to this. This is a fascinating mural. Um, it's another example of sort of what will, what will be revolutionary art? Will it be a, a mural? Will it be modernism? And I think this picture shows you the sort of, maybe the confusion, the uh, uh, sort of the range of options for Cuba as it enters that revolutionary phase. Here's a few more of Jose Marti. And it looks like a panorama of, of, of Latin American history with, with yeah, or a, a new world history with, uh, I'd say that's Chaplin, Che Guevara, looks like uh, maybe some of the figures of Spanish uh, independence. There's one I skipped, my favorite artist. Yeah, this, we're going to be looking at Elso's work later this semester. He's one of my favorite. Um, he's not a contemporary Cuban artist because he died at a very young age. I think he was 32. Yeah, 32. He died of cancer or leukemia. And his artwork is buenísimo. I love his sculpture. And you can see here is Jose Marti sort of portrayed holding uh, a machete. So it's very much kind of like a revolutionary. It looks like he's been shot with arrows kind of. So I think it's capturing the sense of Jose Marti as a sacrificial um, lamb for the Cuban independence. So just before we go on the break, I just again want to remind you that we're talking about now an age where Cuba is now very much a protector of the United States. Jose Marti is dead, but he remains a sort of major icon of Cuban history. And so as we shift into this age of American imperialism, the question will be, so what will spark the revolution and how will the art that precedes the revolution, 
show the seeds of kind of resistance against some of these dictators. Because what happens, the United States supports dictators in Cuba and Mexico and other countries that are that are supportive of American interests, whether it's um, you know business owners or railroads. So the question as we move into the break will be sort of how does the Mexican revolution impact art in Cuba? And um, yeah, that will be the question. So we'll pick up in about 20 minutes around, um, we'll say 9.50, 9.55 around then. And if you have any questions, go ahead and ask away right now. Otherwise you can take a break and I'll be back here in about uh, 20 minutes. After the United States win the Spanish-American War, Jose Marti is killed, <clears throat> Cuba becomes a U.S. protectorate. When I see pictures like these, and by the way, I think this is a chirimoya, this is the fruit I was mentioning a few weeks ago. When I see fruits like these, it feels very much sort of like the arts are out of place. They've lost the sort of sense of, you know, importance or maybe progression towards somewhere it feels like with the united states being a sort of cuba being a protectorate of the united states a lot of these pictures feel kind of like oh another landscape another still life and that's not to criticize the artist but just to point out that you know, at a certain point a landscape starts losing some of its vitality when it's sort of the landscape of another country's sort of occupation so you know in the background in all these paintings from the early 20th century, for me, I feel like, oh, I, you know, Cuba still hasn't set itself free. And so these paintings feel sort of like, you know, the United States is literally the gilded golden frame around the palm trees. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of these golden frames. You see them a lot in New York City at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I think it detracts from the painting. But, and that's a totally subject, subjective. So, you know, these paintings of the landscape, you can imagine a hurricane far away sort of approaching Cuba and that hurricane would be the Mexican revolution and its influence around the world. And the Mexican revolution is sort of the first domino to fall in 20th century. And that includes other dominoes like the Soviet revolution in 1914 and the Cuban revolution in 1959. So you can't overstate the importance of the Mexican revolution, both in terms of Latin American history, but also American foreign policy. And it very much awakens a sort of new effort to create good neighbors with Latin America and especially Mexico. Not so much with Cuba, as we'll see, but certainly with Mexico. And so here is this, this famous picture. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this picture before. It really represents the sort of pinnacle of the, or the peak moment of the Mexican revolution with the likes of Pancho Villa on the left, Meliano Zapata on the right, both coming to Mexico City to sort of um, you know, physically occupy Mexico City as a sign of um, winning, winning in the battle. Um, but neither of these men want to be leaders. They both refuse um, to become presidents. They don't want to be presidents. So Mexico kind of sinks back into revolution eventually. But this picture really shows you sort of this peak moment when everyone's sort of assembled for the photograph. And I cannot think of a more eclectic portrayal of people in the background you know it doesn't look like you see too many much gender variety and certainly in latin america the question of sort of machismo will become interesting when we look at the cuban revolution but just as far as mexico is concerned this definitely is a major historical moment showing you sort of the, the indigenous overlooked indigenous marginalized people represented by pancho villa and zapata here finally reaching a level of political importance as they sort of sit on their thrones here in Mexico City. So the Mexican Revolution begins in 1910, the very much a response to um, Porfirio Diaz, this guy here. And he's actually, if I remember correctly from the Frida Kahlo book we're reading in the other class, he's full-blooded Native American and he would put on whitening to make himself seem less native. So when you look at the age of American imperialism, even Mexican sort of the sense of Mexican imperialism, um, it's very much an, an era when Mexico continues to marginalize the indigenous, marginalize the masses of poor and uneducated and elevate American interest, elevate modernizing interests and elevate the powerful interests of Mexican elite. And you can see for how many years Porfirio, 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 some people can say Porfirio or Porfirio Diaz was in power, 35 years. And just imagine 
any American president being in power for 35 years. I mean, that's insane to just think about what that means as far as, well, one, having the same person in charge, but also the sort of stagnance or stagnation that might eventually take place um, having the same person in power. And that's really, I think, a good way of explaining the Mexican Revolution, that people were sick of this guy and he refused to um, basically remove himself from power. And that's basically the thing that triggers the sort of Mexican Revolution. And I think you can see this picture itself shows how many awards, you know, and, and medals he has, I think goes to show the sort of, um, he's overstayed his welcome. Um, he's got one too many medals um, on his chest. So he has this police force of Mexican rurals. Um, and this is very much like a parallel to Batista, the, the Cuban equivalent might be a, the dictator Batista who's in power, not, as for, not for as long as Porfirio Diaz, but certainly representing the elite interests of Cuba in the same way Porfirio Diaz represents the elite interest in Mexico at the expense or at the exclusion of the marginal, the poor, the landless poor who want access to land. And much, most of the land or much of the land in Mexico, like in Cuba, is controlled by the United States. And he outlaws freedom of the press. I'm talking about Porfirio Diaz in Mexico. And he expels, exiles these two writers, these two brothers who, are, who wrote critically about um, Diaz and his regime and their exile to the United States, where they continue to write on behalf of the Cuban revolution. So or, I'm sorry, Mexican revolution. So you kind of have a parallel with someone like Jose Marti, so intellectuals who are exiled from their country and, and drumming up support for, their, for the cause in the United States. And a lot of people support um, this sort of romantic idea of revolution in Mexico or even in Cuba while you also have people who support um, maybe the, the status quo, and those might be American business interests in the United States. So there's a full range, just like you saw in American Civil War with abolitionists who are more pure, moral purists who were against slavery, to maybe Northerners who just wanted to sort of um, balance the economies of the North and South without the unfair advantage of slavery, of course, um, not an advantage to the slaves themselves. And Tierra y Libertad is really the rallying cry of the Mexican Revolution. Freedom and land, you know, the idea of not being able to grow your own food and buy property. All of this very much is the legacy of the Hacienda system in Cuba set up by the Spanish colonizers, basically wherein um, you were tied to the land, you were required to work in the land, just like a serf or a slave. Maybe it's not quite the same as legal slavery, but it might as well be slavery because you're not allowed to leave the place where you work. So one big part of the Mexican Revolution is sort of ongoing legacies, the stains of colonization with people tied to the landowner, these rich landowners who have a lot of land. Another side is also rebelling against American interests in Mexico and the harsh working conditions. And you could see a parallel to what's going on today with manufacturing, a lot of American manufacturing happening in Mexico and hopefully Mexican workers are getting paid enough where they won't rebel against American governments or American businesses. But I think you could understand if let's say there's a Mexican revolution today, well, there would still today be a lot of American companies who are producing things for our, consum for our consumption produced in Mexico. And if there was a revolution knocking on the door of Mexico today, a lot of American companies would be very scared that their manufacturing would have to maybe relocate to somewhere more stable. And so that's sort of the tricky thing about outsourcing you know, your, your business model to other countries where there's maybe less stability. And of course, the other side of that is American imperialism, sort of maybe if you have Mexican, the Mexican government supporting US interests at the expense of Mexican interests, there's a real disconnect. You know, government should of course support the interests of the people first and not foreign investors. So that's really one part of the imbalance within Mexico at this time. And it's not unlike what you'll see with the Cuban revolution, with the Cuban government supporting the interests of the American mafia or the American sugar producers over the expense, at the expense of an average Cuban. And we enter eventually this good neighbor policy, uh, which we'll see soon. So when we, this is a quote, I went to the Library of Congress to see what kind of uh, 
wonderful historical artifacts you have from the um, United States from this era showing American ownership in Mexico. And here's a quote I copied from the Library of Congress. And it's just, a for me, it's very reminiscent of the political cartoon we saw of American sort of imperial power in Cuba, but this is sort of more of a verbal equivalent of sort of kind of explaining and apologizing for American foreign policy during Mexico, during the, the Diaz regime at the beginning of the century. So you can look at this quote if you wanna check out the PDF later. Um, so here's an example, I was talking about American interests, like mining interests. The United States owned a lot of the mines in Cuba. And here you have Mexican workers protesting the conditions. Now, keep in mind, you know, we're in an era where I think we're improving relations to a degree, depending on where you're talking about in Latin America. But even today, a lot of US companies, let's say you produce pesticides, right? Maybe you produce pesticides for growing raspberries. And the United States makes a law that says, these pesticides are too dangerous for workers. So we outlaw the pesticide. Well, maybe the company now starts selling the pesticide to Guatemala because Guatemala doesn't have such strict rules about um, protecting workers for various reasons, right? So that company could take advantage of those rules and start sending, you know, start poisoning workers without them knowing it in other countries just because it has lax laws. Well, likewise in Mexico, you might imagine mining conditions in Mexico were probably a lot more unsafe because maybe the rules of the United States were a little, you know, maybe at this time, not very much, but to a degree, a little safer for Americans. Um, and maybe the mining company knows that it can benefit from having mining take place in a country where there's lax labor laws. And I think we would all agree that that's really bad because one, it exploits laborers, uh, laborers but also it sort of com companies taking advantage of other countries and it sort of creates a situation rife for revolution. And that's definitely what happens in Cuba, where at a certain point, if you're just benefiting American companies and Americans are traveling to Cuba to, to gamble and to enjoy Cuban life, a similar analogy might be Cancun. You know, if, if all of Mexico becomes like Cancun, the sort of enclave of Americans that are completely disconnected with the typical Mexican who might not be able to afford to feed his or her family with the salary, you're going to create a situation ripe for revolution. So here in Mexico at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, you see a, an analogy of a, almost a parallel or a precursor to what we see in Cuba with American interest taking a big, American capitalist interest taking a big interest in Cuba. Here we could see this train crossing the valley and you can imagine what it means, you know, NAFTA wouldn't exist without highways or trains that bring all those goods to the United States. And likewise here, there was an effort by England and the United States to build a railroad crossing Mexico to diminish the cost of shipping between the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. Now, this is probably at the beginning of the, the era of the canal as well. And of course, the Panama Canal probably makes some of these railroads obsolete. And these are all um, clips from the Library of Congress, so you can look online if you want. And you can see the headlines about, you know, revolution is now in Mexico. And this means, you know, revolution is on the doorstep of the United States, which is, you know, even closer than the Cuban Revolution, but both very consequential for American policy. So when we talk about the shift from the age of American imperialism to ostensibly a good neighbor policy. And yes, in a, a lot of ways, America's policy does become less aggressive, less, we become less willing to support dictators just for the sake of it, depending on where you are. And, but overall, I think still we're advancing American interests because the whole point of this foreign policy is to make sure one, that during World War I and World War II, countries like Germany aren't taking oil from Mexico, oil that we, maybe we need to fight the civil, to fight World War I, World War II, but also just to keep foreign powers out of Latin America still, especially in the age of communism, when you very much have this, I, the, the specter of communism, to quote Karl Marx, the opening of the Communist Manifesto says, there's a specter haunting Europe and that specter is communism. Well, certainly the United States, if if you have a communist revolution in Mexico, which means public ownership of private companies, a lot of these uh, railroad barons, Rockefellers, the oil tycoons, the, the 
the owners of these big capitalist entities, they don't want the government to, to, pub, to make public their corporation. They don't want to basically give up their private holdings. So that's a real existential threat to the United States to have a communist revolution at the, at the doorstep. You know, likewise with the Cuban revolution, but this helps go a ways in explaining the um, sort of tempering of, uh, or the sort of, uh, yeah, tempering of American foreign policy from more aggressive imperialism to more sort of uh, good neighbor policy as Fred, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt calls it. So revolution is now in Mexico. And this still is sort of before the age of communism. Um, there is some communism involved with some of the sort of different political um, kind of uh, stakeholders in all of this. But really it's more, I think, the idea of kind of American imperialism and Mexico dominated by Porfirio Diaz, the 32 year reign of Diaz, and it being totally out of touch and out of stride with the average Mexican. So here you can imagine sort of the importance of maybe a Mexican revolution to a place like Texas. I mean, it's kind of like today with what's going on. And by the way, I would point out that as we look at American foreign policy in Mexico and Cuba, and you can extrapolate into Latin America, a lot of what's going on with the border today is very much the sort of the result of the Cold War and many years, many decades of American foreign policy tinkering in other countries like in Central America, where you don't really have a, a, a big tax base or a stable political leadership. And I think a lot of what's going on today with migrants, not just so much from other parts of the world, but definitely from Central America and other parts of Latin America, it's very much the result of American foreign policy during the Cold War and even up until the recent decades. So that's something to keep in mind that these, the, what we're looking at is somewhat historical, but it's more relevant from a, as far as contemporary world than ever, because we still have the kind of border being the result, the sort of, it, it being the sort of the byproduct of American foreign policy. And you see that um, with refugees fleeing into Texas, like from Mexico here, um, and I think a lot of people today would say, you know, people fleeing from Latin America are refugees fleeing from political conflict. And the United States certainly plays a, a big part in not helping solve those problems because the United States is acting its own interest. And this guy, American ambassador to Mexico, certainly, you know, plays a big negative role in kind of, he kind of prolongs a revolution, for instance, after that famous photo of Zapata in Mexico City, eventually you have um, a new leader who rises to power, who starts brokering peace with the likes of Zapata and, and Pancho Villa and others. But the United States comes in and basically, basically, well, let me go back. Porfirio Diaz is, says he's going to hold elections. And the day or so before the election takes place, he throws, he, he imprisons the opponent. So um, um, Madero is the name of the candidate. So instead of Porfirio Diaz allowing for elections after 30 years of power, he throws Madero into jail. Madero ends up escaping prison and starts rallying people against Porfirio Diaz, ends up being assassinated um, or kind of uh, basically the United States has, a, has a, a coup against him. And this is really just because the United States cares more about protecting American interests in Mexico to the point where we even send troops to Veracruz and <clears throat> do so to protect our oil interests and in Veracruz because the United States is well aware that World War I is on the horizon. So there's sort of this last effort to sort of be an imperial power and to push a Mexican policy in a favorable, favorable direction towards the United States, but it really sort of only results in the opposite, where Mexicans become that much more bitter towards American involvement in Mexico, just like we see in Cuba. And so when we see some examples of Mexican muralism, you know, you have to kind of see it partly as sort of the same kind of anger towards the United States. We'll see a lot of sort of reckoning with American imperialism in, in Cuba, just like we see in Havana. And here's this wonderful headline of just because it relates back to some of the pictures of the aristocrats we saw in Cuban, early Cuban history, kind of like Mexican aristocrats are fleeing into the United States, partly because the people like Pancho Villa and Zapata are 
doing land redistribution on their own. They're not waiting for the government to do it. They're literally sending their forces of, of, of uh, caballeros, you know, campesinos on horseback into the large estates, the haciendas, and ousting the aristocrats who probably join the refugees um, on their way into the United States. And these Ameri these Mexican aristocrats are seen by Americans as, you know, not aristocrats, we're probably just like, you know, a Mexican, like ever, any other Mexican. So, you know, this is still an era where the United States very much is, you know, uh, un has this language barrier with Mexico and very little cross-pollination, um, except for the Mexican-American War. And here you can see the romance. You might think of how this relates to someone like George Washington or even Che Guevara. I think Pancho Villa is very much like a Che Guevara, a sort of revolutionary who, who stands up to the United States and is never captured because the United States does in fact send troops into Mexico with the tacit support of the Mexican government to capture Porfirio, uh, to capture Pancho Villa, but we never succeed. So he's really a wonderful example of someone who's able to sort of run circles around uh, the United States. And I think that's why we tried to get Che Guevara so we wouldn't have a, maybe a repeat of a Pancho Villa. But you know, the Mexican Revolution is a fascinating sort of moment of modernization. You can see a lot of Mexican women participated in the Mexican Revolution. Likewise, trains played a big role in sending Mexicans all around Mexico and also the federales to, to fight against the Mexican campesino movement. Um, the trains really open up Mexico to a whole new level of cross-pollination. And you know, the trains are sort of the vehicle of the, the Mexican Revolution. So I think you can appreciate the sort of um, when your revolution takes place has a lot to do with how it sort of plays out. And likewise, in Cuba, you're going to see in Cuba, Cuban revolution is very much defined by the Cold War, with the threat of nuclear destruction, and by the influence of Soviet, the Soviet art world um, on Cuba. And it's very different than the Mexican Re revolution, which is defined by trains, a campesino movement, um, and sort of addressing historical realities within Mexico, mainly sort of landless indigenous people. And these three artists are the big sort of uh, artistic response to the Mexican revolution. And a sort of people in Mexico, whether they're artists who write manifestos about the importance of art, um, or these artists who are trained in Paris and in Europe and want to sort of take the idea of you know, this, the arts as a sort of vehicle for revolution for the people and bring it to Mexico, kind of like the way Simon Bolivar witnessed, you know, Napoleon and wanted to bring that spirit back to the new world. Well, these guys all bring the spirit of art and fresco making like you see in the Renaissance in Europe. And people in Mexico, particularly like the Minister of Education, understand that art can do a, a lot of good for the country, especially an illiterate country, because it visualizes that which otherwise you might have to put in writing. And so if, just like in the Renaissance, when you had uh, Christians who maybe couldn't read the Bible, well, the arts served a really valuable role in visualizing stories to the illiterate. And likewise, as a way to crystallize Mexican identity, the arts serve an invaluable role in the Mexican revolution, especially in the wake of it, in promoting a new Mexican identity, particularly this kind of mestizo or mixed identity, um, that middle kind of between the extremes in Mexico. And, you know, originally a lot of Mexican muralism very much resembles satire. Um, I wanted to show you the book that we were looking at because a lot of the early Mexican muralist work whether it's Siqueiros or Orozco, it's kind of driven by satire. Um, kind of like the guy we saw a few weeks ago, the Costumbrista guy who switches from more realism to satire. Um, and interestingly, a lot of the, that satire was just sort of mocking the political elites, the sort of, and you could see even here, the, Costia, the, the famous Catrina um, Calavera, which is a skeleton. She's sort of mocking the aristocracy, kind of the, the dead, walking dead, the sort of inhumanity of the, of the elite. And you can see here, Siqueiros is a wonderful example of this revolutionary art. So remember, we're, this is a more class on Cuban revolution, but we see a model here for artists fighting in the revolution, literally fighting, taking up arms. And he has this idea of sort of a new mestizo art. So it's much more than just sort of a revolution against Porfirio Diaz, but also, also offering like a new world vision of art that isn't like a kind of 
retro regressive kind of and it's not social realism and it's not modernism so just keep that in mind and we haven't looked at modernism yet but remember we're, we're not yet there but one of the first things is mexican muralism as a as a possible choice for the cuban artists before the revolution to sort of mirror what's going on in mexico with the arts being this really important way of crystallizing that sense of national identity a revolutionary identity and here's an example of his work i like that we're looking kind of down um, from above he has these very dramatic uh, dynamic compositions <laughs> and it kind of makes you feel like i don't know maybe these people are marching towards you um, but I think you can immediately understand the appeal, appeal of muralism. And remember with muralism, we're talking about work that's public, that's big, that's outdoors. And I want you to really keep this in the back of your head as you think about the Cuban revolution, both and also in terms of just the arts in general, theoretically, like, you know, what's the value of a mural versus an easel painting? And what makes, what contributes to that value? Is it there's a, a mural is sort of by definition public and very big. I mean, there's exceptions, of course, but I think there's probably a trade off that comes with muralism. And that might be that sort of highly personal, emotional quality that you see in someone like Frida Kahlo's work. Um, so that's just something to consider uh, as we move forward sort of muralism as a viable choice for revolution in either your country that you created, but also in Cuba. So here we could see how the freedom of the press, you know, Siqueiro is very much continued to um, fight for the Mexican revolution even after he was exiled. Um, so he's similar to the brothers we saw a moment ago who were exiled or Jose Marti who's exiled from, or even uh, Fidel Castro and, uh, who's exiled from Mexico, or at least in this case, Siqueiro and continues drumming up support for the Mexican revolution in the United States. And this is the guy who painted that mural we saw earlier um, very much aware of the bigger picture with America kind of trying to um, subvert the Mexican revolution so it doesn't bleed into the United States with our own revolution. And as you probably know, the United States could very much kind of, at this point in time, the early 1900s, the United States is not immune from revolutionary forces, especially communism. So we're gonna see in the United States you know, very much a potential for upheaval. Um, and that's kind of why we see the good neighbor policy, especially in reaction to the Soviet revolution. And I think I said earlier, 1914, but it's really 1917. And this, you can't overstate the importance of the Soviet revolution because, and we'll talk at another day about sort of the, the nature of communism versus capitalism and maybe issues related to human nature. But for now, I think it's really important to understand with communism, the reason why it's such a threat to maybe American interest capitalism is it means private ownership, right? Government ownership of property, especially we like the, it, of the means of production. So the government would control. Now it makes sense perhaps when you're talking about electricity and plumbing and school and post office, things that are very regular and don't need a lot of innovation. But you know, maybe it gets a little trickier when it comes to healthcare and especially maybe innovative technologies where if any of you kind of has met anyone who's lived in a country with socialism, there's, there's this sort of both sides, the benefit of free healthcare, but maybe waiting in line for healthcare and maybe lower quality healthcare. And there's exceptions and um, it's very complicated. But I think it's just generally speaking, understand that this threat of communism is a, an existential threat to the American imperialism. And so when we talk about that shift to good neighbor policy, it's really because the United States doesn't want a domino effect of communist countries uh, becoming communist in Latin America, leading to a communist revolution in the United States, because that would mean Rockefeller and Vanderbilt have to take all their money and find another place where they're safe from revolution. Really, that's what it comes down to. So we're looking at Lenin here. And so a lot of big things are going to be happening in the 20th century that are going to have a major impact on Latin America in Mexico and Cuba, especially communism um, in Cuba. And of course, World War One. World War One is the first time the war starts industrializing death, which is to say, using all of these innovations of technology, railroads, steam engine, gas, synthetic production of chemicals, 
and using it to hurt each other in war. Things like using gas, you know, dangerous, noxious gases, or using weapons of mass destruction like machine guns. And I think this picture really shows you war, an updated image of war. You might compare this to the picture we saw of the soldiers, the African American soldiers in the Civil War, who even though they're wearing the uniform of the Union Army, you still can see the individual underneath. Here, several decades later, war has become this sort of mechanized thing where I can't even make out the individual underneath this almost death-like mask that, of course, you wore during um, the trench warfare to make sure you don't suffocate or get killed by gas. So really a horrifying vision of war now. It's not, there's nothing heroic about war when it's mechanized like this. And you know this really goes to show a sort of reckoning with technology where, and people like Pablo Picasso will tackle this with subjects like Guernica, and I'll talk about that a later day, another day. But I think you can immediately see how technology plus war is kind of like you know industrialization plus slavery. Like you're, you're really taking something bad like war and making it even worse because your capacity to destroy and kill is such a, to, it reaches such an extreme that like with nuclear war, just going to war means the end of everyone. So we're gonna see that in the Cuban revolution that it comes of age during the age of nuclear annihilation. And that very much defines a lot of the political um, context of Cuba, the same way that World War I kind of defines the context of, or defines the Mexican revolution with the United States not wanting Germany to take all the oil from Mexico, for instance, um, and also the Monroe Doctrine. So this picture shows a man who has a prosthetic face. If you actually Google uh, World War I photos, you can find what his face actually looks like. And it's just basically he doesn't have a face. So this is like an artist making a prosthetic face for this man to wear. And it's a remarkable sort of superficial veneer of normalcy. Um, that really covers the sort of horrors of how war affects people. And remember, war means people come back from war with wounds, with, uh, with missing limbs. And, you know, countries receiving these sort of veterans have to really reckon with, um, you know, the foreign policy that led to that and also take care of the people who are wounded in war. So, you know, I don't want to get too involved in foreign policy at this time. I want to shift back to the Mexican Revolution to look at um, the impact of muralism, but also again, to consider that modernism never really, modernism likewise doesn't become the major kind of um, vehicle for the Cuban revolution. It's not the visual sort of, um, sort of uh, vocabulary of revolution. And that's something we'll, we'll be thinking about more as we move forward. Why modernism? What is it about modernism that maybe for example, the Cuban Revolution very decidedly rejects modernism and abstraction in the same way kind of Hitler rejects abstract art. He sees it as degenerate. He sees it probably as not nationalistic. So that's something, you know, apart, uh, Hitler aside, I think you could still look at the sort of why countries that are revolutionary might or might not embrace modernism. And that's something to consider. Remember, modernism is abstraction, sort of a rejection of narrative painting. It's not social realism. And I'd say even it's not even Mexican muralism. Maybe Mexican muralism has more modernism, but it's, it's very different. It's more of a personalized language. And I think you could see modernism as the result of the influence of photography becoming the new form of accuracy. So photography enters the scene in the late 1800s and prior to that, maybe a painter, you might have hired a painter to capture your portrait or to paint an historical event or anything else. But with the advent of photography, suddenly artists are free to explore and experiment with paint. And a lot of art historians would say, would agree that modernism is very much the result of photography liberating painting from the constraints of me needing to be accurate or nationalistic. So you might consider that as you consider why modernism might not be the tool of revolution. And now I think that's totally debatable. It depends on if you define revolution as like a, a public social movement versus revolution as sort of a personal interior internal struggle. And you could say it's both or one or the other or neither, but certainly that's something to consider the 
you know, the revolution of looking into the mirror and saying, I need to change this about myself versus the revolution of maybe looking out at the world at, through like a camera lens and saying that needs to be changed. And both are very important, maybe, but uh, important ways of addressing revolution, but they are very different. I would say modernism has more of the potential of addressing revolution on a personal level, sort of you and the the painting on an easel. And of course you guys know an easel painting is, you know, a painting on a canvas and that's distinct from a mural, which is a painting on a wall. And so one is more about architecture. And I think you could understand how a mural is almost by definition, by definition, more public, more political. And of course, you know, the expression, the personal is political. So that also kind of blows everything up that I just said, because you could say the personal is political and say, well, me looking into the mirror at sort of my own self, as a kind of a political moment. So, you know, it really is up to you to sort of think about the underlying assumptions that you all have about revolution, what it means to be political. And that's why I'm having you guys sort of make your posters and your mural, um, your own vision for a mural to start really thinking more concretely about um, the kinds of challenges the Cuban revolution will face when it has to think about, well, how do we crystallize a Cuban revolution um, in the late 20th century. Well, Mexico's, Mexico's uh, solution was really using muralism. I'd say that's kind of like what you see on the left, a sort of more realistic, um, but you see kind of in Cuba, this sort of modernism originally and why Cuban muralism, mural, why Mexican muralism doesn't take on, doesn't take hold in Cuba, I think has a lot to do with the absence of government support for the arts. And I think that goes back to the fact that the United States is sort of this imperial power. And, you know, got, uh, the presidents of Cuba, who are mostly dictators, many of them are dictators, are not interested at all in crystallizing uh, government that supports everyone. They're really working on behalf of the elite or the American interests. So you don't see muralism take a hold in Cuba like you do in Mexico. Um, partly, again, because you know, the government doesn't support it. Someone like Gerardo Machado um, assassinates uh, political or uh, some of these early uh, revolutionary leaders. This guy, I think, was friends with, with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. Um, I, I saw his character in the movie Frida. So I think he's an interesting example of kind of that shows Cuba is sort of in this place reminiscent of maybe during the Porfirio Diaz regime where he was assassinating any of the political opposition. So this guy becomes sort of a martyr um, of political opposition, opposition in this era preceding the revolution. Remember the revolution in Cuba is 1959. So we're looking at artists who are modernists who have or are going to react to a degree to the Cuban revolution. I think you even see that here with Abela um, definitely kind of channeling a little bit of the Diego Rivera influence. I think both in terms of the sort of the, the stylized or sort of some semi-realistic, semi kind of uh, stylized um, figures here. And I might ask you, well, how does that, how does this compare to something we've seen here on the left? How would you, anyone wanna, how does this update Cuba? So the one on the left, you've got the painting from the mid 1800s of maybe a, a Spaniard, who is maybe maybe not high class, but more like a, a guajiro, you know, campesino. I don't think we call him, you know, I think the, the figure on the right is more a slave. And so he'd be higher up the cast. But it looks like Abela on the right is updating the portrayal of the Cuban guajiro. What would you say is distinct about the picture on the right as far as the framing of the guajiro than, than the figure on the left? What's, what's, the, what's been updated? I still see a rooster. <laughs> I've got a, someone on the chat says, uh, a lot more culture. What do you mean by a lot more culture? Yes, togetherness. Yeah, I think that's a, the thing I noticed, the community, right, right, community. That's such an interesting observation because I think it really goes to show, remember we're talking about Cuba, Cuban independence was postponed until the American, Spanish American war. And even then it was postponed even longer. So in a way, I think you can understand why the reframing of the Guajiro from sort of this solitary figure in the countryside, it almost foreshadows the Cuban revolution's emphasis on community by putting him together with others. Um, yeah, they're down on the ground together. He's humble, yeah, high up looking down. Yeah, we're kind of looking up at him on the left. And here we're kind of like another 
we're like we're we are the equivalent of the woman on the left, the slave woman looking up at him, right? We're lower lower status looking up at him from the side of the road. Whereas on the right, it feels like we're about to join in the sort of community. And yeah, I think that's an important observation because you think about the Cuban revolution shifts to togetherness, kind of the importance of community and the collective rather than necessarily maybe the individual sort of Guajiro seeking, you know, kind of his own, his own path. I think certainly the Cuban revolution shows the importance of working together to defeat the enemy, whether it's during the Cuban independence or during the Cuban revolution. So yeah, that sense of community, you know, uh, I think even the homes around them, the sort of importance of community as the context for this guy, instead of like a horse being the sort of support for him. Uh, let's see some, some more. And here, I think you really see the influence of the Mexican muralists. Um, many of these artists, I'm sure, I guarantee were, and I know were aware of the Mexican muralism, but one of the big challenges, as you might have read in the Cuban modernism article, is it's not so easy to make a mural. And I've, I've never personally tried to make a mural, but it requires layers of wet, uh, I can't remember what the actual word for the um, fresco material, but you're layering sort of your sketch on top of wet material that's like a kind of drying concrete, if you will, and, and then you're adding color on top. And I know a lot of the reading I've done about efforts to copy the Mexican murals resulted in disaster, mainly because people didn't have the right recipe or the right formula. Who knows, maybe even the Mexican muralists, uh, maybe they, they sabotaged Cuban efforts, but probably more likely it's just because people didn't have the internet where they could, you could email Diego Rivera and say, hey, Diego, how did you make your murals? Oh, well, here you go. This is a recipe you need of the mixture of this to that. And so I think partly Cuba didn't have access to um, the knowledge that people like Diego Rivera, Siqueiros and Orozco acquired by traveling to Europe and visiting the Italian Renaissance frescoes. Diego Rivera was in Europe the entire Mexican revolution and came back afterwards. Um, so he spent the entire Mexican revolution learning how to do, make fresco <coughs> and brought that knowledge back to Mexico. But I think here you see the same effort to tackle sort of subject matter that's more public, less personalized, but more about social change. So what do you see here? What's going on in this picture? I notice there's no one focal point. It seems to be a lot of different things. And as far as this question of art being more personal versus more maybe political, more public, you notice when there's no one focal point, that emotional connection isn't established maybe between one subject. So you're more meant to establish connection by kind of piecemealing all of these elements of society together. So I think this would be a good example of art that's more on the other side of not the personal and emotional, but rather the more public and looking at broader social societal reality. So some things I notice here is the military, presence of the military. They look like American troops are probably more, um, these would probably be more Cuban revolution, or the, not the revolution, but the Cuban government. But they could, you know, for me, the outfit looks like it could be American soldiers. And I think you can see the capitalists up above. It looks like the sugarcane harvest. But I think, what's the overall message here? What anyone, uh, it looks like a little intimidating. Yeah, it feels very much like a police state. Like a, like you don't, it doesn't look like, this isn't a happy picture of Cuba, a paradise with with the Royal Poinciana red flowers in bloom and a Guajiro, you know, on his horse. This looks like a military state, um, very much Cuba. I feel like the, the two figures on the right are maybe represent Cubans looking on in, in awe or disgust at sort of how their country is maybe being vulturized by the forces of capitalism. Any, do you see any hints, uh, any reference to the United States here? Any o o overt references? Yes, a very oppressive, yes. Also, because the groups in the back being oppressed, they're sort of like, you know, even though slavery is over, I guarantee it probably means that it's even worse for a lot of people because now the, now the people who are, who are working on sugar, they have to pay for all their housing and all that, and they get paid crap <laughs> for their work. Uh, the tall buildings in the back, yeah, there's almost a, it almost feels like that's the United States maybe um, kind of juxtaposed. I almost feel like there's a, sem a slight sense of the American flag on that ship with a sort of that block and the stripes maybe. 
uh, but it does look very much like the United States is, you know, the elements of capitalism, um, like almost as if Cuba's now been sort of dressed up against the United States with these soldiers guarding this whole status quo. I think you guys got that pretty well. Uh, let's move on to some more pictures. We can, you can look at this um, on your own time. So this manifesto is written by these artists in the 1920s, 1930s. And, um, and you could see a lot of these elements of the manifesto are very much going to be the, the sort of reforms that the Cuban revolution addresses. Public education. Public education is one of the big benefits from the Mexican revolution. Um, Frida Kahlo, you know, her education probably was, you know, she was the beneficiary of Mexican revolution that benefits of public education. And you can understand the value of public education sort of innately, you know, everyone speaking, uh, reading and writing, being able to read the laws, be able to sign your name, you know, you, ha you have like a legal identity and notice Yankee imperialism and for the betterment of the Cuban farmer and worker. So in this manifesto in the 1920s, 1930s, you can see these artists, and this was signed by several artists, they're already kind of fighting for issues that haven't been addressed either by the war for independence against Spain or by the maternal American Colombia who is you know, taking care of Cuba on its first steps. Well, here we are 27, 35 years later, and these artists are still clamoring for social change in Cuba. And that's because, you know, for all of its uh, pretending to be otherwise, the United States hasn't really been the mother raising Cuba to be independent as the cartoon we saw earlier kind of pretended to be, to say. So here you can see this artist questioning sort of the value of easel painting versus revolution. So you notice here the artist, and you can think about as an artist, you might have to kind of tackle this subject as you guys come of age as artists sort of, an authentic large scale revolutionary art. But this sort of assumes that, you know, revolutionary, that revolutionary art is only revolutionary because it's bigger. And so, you know, I would challenge you guys to also think about what it means to be small, a small revolution, you know, a small scale revolution, and maybe consider if, if can you be revolutionary and modernist? Can, is it, can an abstract painting be revolutionary? And you might consider, well, let's say you're in a country that's very, and we'll say fas a fascist country, a, a country like Nazi Germany. Well, in that situation, I think it's very revolutionary to make an abstract work of art that's expressive and very personalized because it's sort of asserting your own individuality in the face of conformity. Because that's one of the main vehicles for fascism is conformity. And that might come in the future in the form of conformity of social media, where we all feel this implicit obligation to be like each other. Well, Hitler really came to power by convincing everyone that there's this sort of ideal standard that everyone needs to conform to. So that's another kind of thing to consider, sort of, you know, you might consider modernism not to be maybe as theoretically fit for revolution, but it all depends on whether or not the revolution is truly liberation or if it's really just sort of a new status quo that's oppressive. And I think you'll see at this point in the Cuban revolution, when Cuban art enters the streets in the form of graffiti, you kind of have a new challenge to the revolution, a new revolution on the street. That's sort of, you know, you can see history going in circles um, ad nauseum. So Gattorno is one of these exceptions who tries to experiment with some of this um, muralism from Mexico. And you can see he's very much a fan of the Italian art uh, the fresco tradition from Europe, just like Diego Rivera, Siqueiros, but there really is no tradition in Cuba, like you see in Mexico, even Mexico, you could trace the muralism tradition back to um, the Maya, the ancient Maya culture of muralism. So, you know, it, it, maybe muralism goes deeper in Cuba or Mexico than it does in Cuba. Maybe even the tropical climate of Cuba might not be the best for outdoor murals, but I think certainly there's an effort to emulate what's going on in Mexico. I think that's pretty obvious here when you put this, this one side by side here, the Gatorno painting decorative panel for the, so, you know, the idea of sending people out to the rural countryside to educate people, um, especially children, the future, you know, if you educate children, you have a whole new uh, potential for um, transformation of society. I think you see that here, Diego Rivera's painting um, on the right, um, him you know, sending in people to the rural parts of Mexico to educate people to join in the sort of national, emerging national identity with literacy um, and with that's all the self-esteem that comes from being literate 
um, being, and remember literacy isn't just reading books, it's being able to sign your name, legal documents, right? Being able to read a contract before you sign it. Um, when I was in Guatemala, most farmers in Guatemala, the, your peasant farmers, your campesinos, they live, they have the worst land. They live up in the mountains because all the best land was taken by the ascenderos, the Spanish aristocrats. And if you want to compete with say coffee growers who are large landowners, the smaller farmers have to organize into a collective, into a union or into in some kind of um, uh, yeah, a collective of small farmers. And they have to legally become legally viable, like legal existence has to happen. And so that you maybe need lawyers. Each individual farmer has to maybe become legally viable or, or legally sort of official by the government. So that means each of them, if, they, if they're not literate, they might have someone take advantage of them, but you can understand the nature of the problem um, with colonialism and the legacy of colonialism with no literacy. And certainly in any country where there's been a lot of small, like small people, small elite of people benefiting at the expense of the majority, that elite doesn't want the majority to be educated because as soon as you educate the majority, you have revolutionaries like Nelson Mandela, Che Guevara, who will challenge the status quo. So one big way to have a revolution is to educate everyone so that everyone has an equal stake in society as opposed to being sort of left out of the picture, which is the case with Mexico and Cuba. Both the majority of people were very uh, much left behind by modernism um, in the 20th century. So here's an example of Diego Rivera, one of his famous murals. You can see it, how public it is. This is in the Ministry of Education in Mexico City. You can see how big it is, how it's tackling history, and really in a, very deep, in a very kind of impersonal way, but still, in this, it, but it, I'd say it very much makes up for the impersonal qualities by showing you this sort of ambition, scope and scale and tackling all these elements of Cuban of Mexican history. And you can see some of the details here above. Like we probably see a little, recognize a lot of the things we've seen so far, the conquest uh, and other even probably elements of Cuban history here. Although this is of course dedicated to Mexican history, but these kinds of things would be, uh, people in Cuba were aware of these kinds of um, efforts to crystallize identity with painting, but there isn't the sort of know-how in Cuba, but there are some efforts. And I think if any of you want to do a really great research paper, you could try to find out what happened to some of these uh, murals. Now, here's an example of, of one that I think is more on the side of kind of American imperialism co-opting um, the arts in Cuba. So here you have Bacardi, which is a famous producer of rum. And that family, after the Cuban revolution, the, the Bacardi family took the logo of Bacardi and transferred it, I think, either to Spain or another country in the Caribbean. But Cuba continues to produce rum under the name Bacardi. So it's a great example of sort of how the revolution created this weird upset in the sort of um, forces of Cuban branding, if you will, or sort of your sort of iconic brands in Cuba. Um, and this mural right here, you can see the sort of smug <laughs> kind of uh, Bacardi representative. This mural was painted by Gattorno. And I think it really just goes to show the sort of way the United States has kind of uh, continued to imperialize everything going on in Cuba with this mural being commissioned by Bacardi. And, and I don't think it's located in Cuba. It's located in, in New York. So this is very much like a, an echo of what we saw earlier of the Cuban landscape being painted, co-opting the sort of Cuban artistic tradition or Cuban landscape for um, New York consumption. Here, you're kind of co-opting the sort of muralism of Cuba the, or the infant stages of muralism in Cuba and co-opting it for the Bacardi company to sort of kind of reinforce the Bacardi label. And this mural, I think in that modernist reading you guys might have read, um, the, the, art, the writer criticizes it for offering a kind of more kind of, if offering kind of a more of a, a pro sort of idealized, every, everything's happy, everything's hunky-dory in, um, in Cuba, which is very different than maybe the Mexican muralist uh, message, which is things are very bad and revolutionary. And so this is very different than the sort of muralism in, in Mexico, which is much more of a, a finger in the face of the status quo. This seems to be, at least depending on how you want to see it, um, seems to be reinforcing the status quo, at least in the mind of the writer who wrote the article. You could see this also as sort of romantically celebrating the campesino and 
maybe the politics being sort of separate from the, the moment you see here. Um, but at, for me, it's just a great example of the United States co-opting, Bacardi co-opting some, some of the artistic efforts in this pre-revolution era. And Carlos Enrique is another example of an artist, very well known, um, who tries tackles muralism. And I think this is a wonderful example showing you the real energy of his um, style. Really uh, wonderfully expressive, kind of like Orozco. But as you can see in the caption here, this was destroyed. Um, so these murals don't even don't survive into the revolutionary era of Cuba. So there's not much, you know, the art, typical Cuban artist um, might have been able after the revolution to go visit these murals and say, oh, let me make murals. Let me find out how to do it. But there really wasn't uh, many, many of these murals didn't survive after the revolution or into the revolution in Cuba. So, you know, it'd be wonderful to find if there's actually some, you know, if you ever go to Cuba to 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 go on, on the hunt for these lost murals, because I'll bet, you know, Cuba's so hard to get to that I bet that would be a really richly rewarding investigation to find out um, what happened to these murals in Cuba. And it looks like, you know, you're tackling maybe the, the war for Cuban independence, the horses, um, but definitely channeling some of that campesino on the horseback um, quality that you see in Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata in Mexico. And here you can see someone we've seen already. This is Jose Marti, is a sort of phantom presence in the back. <clears throat> I don't have a better quality example of these pictures, but I think you can really feel the sense of social, kind of fo focus on social, um, broader social themes and using the image of Marti as a symbol of revolution. And these artists are all clearly um, kind of continuing the call of resistance and revolution because they understand that Cuba is in control or controlled by very powerful American landowners or by elite in Cuba, whether it's the dictators who are squandering a lot of money and siphoning a lot of money for their own personal um, coffers or just sort of the preservation of the status quo period. Um, so, you know, obviously these paintings, you see this sort of ongoing sort of cry of resistance underlying sort of the normalcy offered by the United States imperial policy in Cuba with the United States being the sort of um, presumed protectorate, protector of Cuba. And here, you know, the I think the title here says it all. I think the colors especially belie the kind of reality going on here. So what's happening here? Here we have Carlos Enrique and his campesinos felices, happy peasants. So I think we, I don't need to ask, like these peasants are anything but happy. And I think, you know, it's a very kind of, I think a real harsh critique of the realities of Cuba where it looks like the artist is basically saying your typical peasant, well, how, what is the life of a typical peasant in Cuba here, according to the artist? Anyone? It's a little blurry, but I think you can appreciate, wait, what do we have? Malnutrition perhaps, you know, destitute. It seems like there's a struggle in the background, maybe symbolism with it's pretty ironic. Yeah, the title I think is absolutely ironic. Um, you know, it's saying the exact opposite of what's intended here, which really would be the, the destitute, miserable, poor. And there's a lot of examples, I think, in history of painting, maybe Dorothea, Dorothea Lange's photographs of people during the Dust Bowl. And maybe some of this relates to some of the suffering happening in the Great Depression or the um, maybe a, someone who can't find work farming because American uh, maybe um, American companies don't allow Cuban workers to work on the farms anymore. But certainly I wish it was a little crisper, but I think you can understand this is a very damning critique of the life of a typical Cuban peasant at this time. And one other artist I want to show you before we end up is an example of, of muralism um, that does succeed, but in a sort of more decorative way is Amelia Palaez whose work definitely, I think, really captures the, the modernism that we're talking about, sort of the abstraction. I think you can appreciate how she's channeling some of the Cuban colors, but also um, in a lot of Cuba, you see the reja forjada, which is a forged iron work, which is used as a, uh, usually as a protection against robbers from entering a window. So forged iron designs that are kind of protecting doorways and windows. She's sort of channeling that architecture into these really quirky, wonderful modernist uh, examples of modernism. And next class, we're gonna focus exclusively uh, exclusively on the art and life of, of Wilfredo Lamb, 
before we shift to the revolution. So I want you to keep in mind, we're going to look a little bit more about modernism. And you might consider, well, is this revolutionary? You know, is this Matisse on the left? You know, I think her his color is very much inspired her work. She traveled um, in Europe and, and studied Matisse. And I think his work is very revolutionary as far as the art world. But I don't think you'd say it's revolutionary as far as, you know, tackling injustice and social class. Um, and I think that's the same contrast or same kind of dichotomy between public political art versus very personal and kind of very personally abstract language. And I think Amalia um, Palaya is really, Amelia, Amelia Palaya is really captures that kind of sense of abstract, personalized language. I mean, even the Picasso one, I feel is tackling more uh, kind of more of social themes like identity um, and, you know, your mirror reflection, maybe gender, femininity, the mirror image. Palaya is, I think, is more tackling, more safe, perhaps more, um, and more abstract, more kind of celebrating maybe Cuban sort of style and what you see in Cuba. And they're beautiful, wonderful works of art, but they are very kind of, they're not revolutionary in the sense of, you know, revolution of some of the other things we've seen, the muralism, maybe the subject matter. But ironically, going back to the irony, here in 1959, this, is, this was originally the Havana Hilton. So this would be a great emblem of American imperialism where the United States builds a Hilton Hotel in Havana. Well, after the revolution, it becomes the Havana Libre, the free Havana. So a very funny title rebranding re the Havana Hotel as sort of revolutionary. And down below, you can see this beautiful mural. Um, I, I don't know if it's inspired or literally a reproduction of Pelayas's work, but I think it's a wonderful example of muralism that survives into the revolution. And yet, ironically enough, it's not necessarily a revolutionary mural in the same sense of the Mex Mexican muralists. You know, I don't see many examples of Mexican muralism like Diego Rivera, Orozco, Siqueiros, which, is, which, which leaves it very abstract and kind of decorative, if you will. And so there's a certain irony that the only muralism that survives into the Cuban revolution is kind of the mural that's the least what you might call revolutionary. And again, that's totally debatable depending on how you define revolutionary. Because you could certainly say abstract art is revolutionary and making it big and public, you could say is sort of makes it kind of free, frees it from the sort of constrictions of politics. But again, we'll be talking more about the complexities of defining um, what makes something political or revolutionary or personal, or why that all matters. But I think we could all appreciate that this is definitely more on the sort of modernist and uh, muralism. So we can see this really bizarre blend of muralism and modernism. And lastly, to close, I think you to kind of put a sort of bow on top of everything, you really have to kind of look at this MoMA exhibit in New York City as a sort of, you know, again, to talk about American imperialism, this sort of last sort of kind of patronizing moment by the United States to sort of absorb Cuban art into a sort of pro-America. And this is the age of good neighbor policy. This is after, you know, here we are in 1944. So now we are very much in the age of good neighbor policy where United States doesn't want Cuba to have a revolution. United States doesn't want Mexico to go communist. The United States doesn't want anywhere in Latin America to go communist. So we're walking on eggshells and being very friendly towards Latin America. We even allow Cuba or Mexico to nationalize its oil in 1938 because we're cool with Mexico and Cuba having more of a degree of maybe, or at least Mexico having more sovereignty. Now, Cuba is an exceptional case, um, and especially because after World War I or World War II, we're going to see that the United States enters a whole new era of the Cold War, which departs from the good neighbor policy. So as a sort of last hurrah of this good neighbor policy, you can see the United States puts on this exhibit at the MoMA in New York, the Museum of Modern Art of Cuban modernist art. So it's sort of like absorbing Cuban modernism into a tradition. They put their palm tree, you know, it's sort of like that other places we saw today where they put the palm tree, the tropical, you're sort of capturing that sort of quality of Cuba, but it's so stupid. It's sort of like putting bamboo in an exhibit of bamboo of Japanese art or like, I don't know, a cactus in Southwestern art. Like you gotta put the palm tree in the exhibit of Cuban art. And you can see they really, you know, it shows you the easel paintings, you know, these aren't murals. So these are small 
painting meant for more of a one-on-one. -on -one. There's the palm tree again. Uh, they probably had to bring it outside because palm trees don't grow very well with low light. They lose one frond at a time and then it dies. So here's a painting by Carlos Enriquez. And these show you the scale of the easel paintings. And I think they kind of also kind of show you that, you know, they're a little less sort of in your face than a mural, right? That I think, you know, there's no absolutes in art, but I think as we move forward, really kind of try to internalize this question of what it is about easel paintings, what, what can make an easel painting revolutionary or not? You know, what is it about the, is a one-on-one -on -one engagement with a painting, you know, the scale, the sort of window-sized frame, is that um, revolutionary or is it more revolutionary to go bigger and to address more social themes and to tackle history? And I think generally we might tend to think of that as more revolutionary, right? Um, but then of course it depends on whether you're talking about, whether or not you're talking about revolution in the abstract or revolution in the real, the literal, like celebrating the Cuban revolution and galvanizing a sort of visual language of revolution. So here, I think the arrow is pointing at the example of Carlos Enrique, or I'm sorry, Mario Carreño, the sugarcane cutter is a very famous painting. Um, I'll show you another example later, the sugarcane cutting as a sword. This isn't like happy sugarcane, it's like, you know, maybe the harsh, you know, this is 1943, so sugar harvest continues long after independence. So you can imagine it doesn't, you know, the sun is not less bright and hot. The sugar isn't easier to cut. It's the same thing. Only now maybe you don't have any, um, you know, now maybe it's harder than ever because um, maybe the, uh, well, for all kinds of reasons. So let's just continue into this exhibit. You can see Amalia, Amelia Pelayas, her work is in this exhibit. So, you know, it's a, you could say on one hand, it's a, oh, the United States is celebrating Cuban art. But the other time side, you could say, well, this is part of the good neighbor policy where the United States is sort of condoning Cuban art or supporting Cuban art as a way to sort of release pressure on the sort of resistance movements in Cuba against American imperialism. So it's definitely part of this sort of effort by the Rockefellers, the, maybe the, not literally the Vanderbilts, but the likes of those very rich capitalists who understand that communism could very much threaten their large <laughs> estates, their ownings, their possessions, their, their companies. So this effort by, to, by the MoMA, which is funded by the same people, these robber barons, um, or, and they're not all bad, of course, but you know, in broad brushstrokes, these very you know, powerful capitalists, they're funding these, these exhibits because it's that very much a sort of Cold War or even before the Cold War, a propagandistic effort to maintain the status quo, to allow Mexico to do a little muralism and to invite, invite some of the Mexican muralists to the United States, but not to, as, or as a way to kind of alleviate some of the sort of pressures building so there isn't a full on revolution against the United States. So I think now you can kind of see how far we've kind of come away from this imperial policy towards more of this good neighbor policy, but it's gonna to shift to this Cold, War policy, this Cold War policy, especially because of the Cuban revolution. So I think now you can kind of reframe this picture we saw at first as sort of these early steps kind of really clearly the United States is kind of clueless out of touch with the reality that if, if you have this foreign policy that's only based on self-interest, you're really going to kind of ironically create the, the situ a situation ripe for a revolution because American interests are completely at odds with the interests of your average Cuban. So in a way, the Cuban revolution comes down to sovereignty, sort of this idea of sovereignty and the country Cuba being is sort of, um, you know, in charge of its own destiny rather than the United States influencing Cuba's destiny. So as we move forward, we're definitely going to see a shift to the Cuba, the uh, one to the Cuban Revolution. Yay, we finally get to the Cuban Revolution. We're going to look at a little more modernism as a bridge to the Cuban Revolution, particularly because with Fredo Lam, the artist, the Afro Cuban artist we're going to look at, he chooses to stay in Paris. He doesn't stay in Cuba. And I think that's a fascinating uh, fact, a decision by him to not stay in Cuba because it almost goes to show that modernism, and he's very much a sort of at the, at the tip of the spear of modernism, it just goes to show that it didn't fit comfortably in Cuba. So the question you should have as we move forward is, well, then what, Professor Nixon, what's Cuban art gonna look like? It's not gonna look necessarily modernist. It's not gonna look necessarily like social realism or it might, but one way we're going to tackle that question is to look at how the Soviet Union 
addresses the arts and, and how it handles a question of social realism or modernism, because it very much sets the stage for what happens in Cuba, especially because Cuba will once again shift from being dependent on Spain to becoming dependent on the United States. And guess what? Very soon we're gonna see, instead of the Lady Liberty or Columbia here, and then we'll have, I guess, the Soviet bear, a Soviet. The Soviet becomes the influence on Cuba, where Cuba and Canada become dependent on the Soviet Union, in the same way it was dependent on the United States. But with this twist, with the art world being very much the result of internal things going on with this, within the Soviet Union, influencing the pedagogy and influencing Cuban artists who are studying art in the Soviet Union. And I think the most important thing is Cuban art rejects a lot of what's going on in the United States. Particularly, I think you could say that Cuban art in the sort of 60s and moving forward is sort of like, it, it really rejects the influence of someone like Andy Warhol, the sort of commercial quality of the art world as it's become in the United States. So I think one simplistic way of looking at Cuban art is sort of very much like modern art without Andy Warhol. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, Andy Warhol is very important and I certainly love his work to a degree, but I think I also kind of hate how the art world has become so focused on glamour and fashion and commercialism at the expense of other things which are very important, like, you know, maybe politics, spiritual, and certainly maybe self-expression and importance of, you know, um, social, um, social movements. So when we, as we move forward, we're going to enter the Cuban revolution with a little um, bit of entry um, by way of Wilfredo Lamb. And I will dismiss class. And if you have any questions, please stay on the line. Um, keep in mind, I want you to think about uh, either a mural or a poster, a, a political poster, either on behalf of a revolution taking place in your country that you created, or just tackling um, whatever kind of subject you want. But I think it's a chance for you to think about, well, what's the value of a mural versus the value of a poster? And eventually we'll be looking at some of the Cuban poster art to maybe see how Cuba itself tackles um, posters. Because of what happens initially, Cuban poster art becomes the first sort of wave of visual arts in Cuba eventually to be replaced by the Cuban students who are trained by the revolution, who come of age in the 1980s and offer this totally new vision of, of art and the art world, which is very different than anything else, I think, in the world, which is really going to be the real, you know, meat and potatoes of this class when we finally get to the contemporary Cuban artists. So um, I'll email you, announce about the reading that you should, uh, I'm going to have you start with your reading from the Lewis Kamnitzer book. And I think that's it as far as what I have in my off the top of my head. So if you have any questions, go ahead and ask away. Otherwise, class dismissed, and I will see you next Tuesday.